and skills you gain understanding this technology is directly applicable in your growth toward semiconductor industry. When uh, uh, essentially the uh, idea is that we still do layer by layer manufacturing of a more complex electronic system. Is there the materials are higher quality, production is finer, a higher resolution of, uh, uh, of the, the, the size of objects are much smaller, and of course the performance and complexity of devices are also higher. Whereas in flexible electronics, we can maybe uh, at least at the entry level understand simple uh, layer devices that compose two electrodes, a couple of active layers in between. We can appreciate the passive uh, devices like the resistors, inductors, capacitors that can be turned to formidable sensors, or in some cases they can be also uh, used as active elements of electronic systems. Now, my task in the second round today, uh, morning before we uh, 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 break for uh, Intel presentation is, what are these technologies? What kind of technologies we, are we have available in our disposal to print and to manufacture electronics at large and low cost scale. Uh, so I'm going to basically look into the more manufacturing uh, and uh, technology side in this set of slides. Don't forget, again, what we print on, we haven't even discussed, don't forget, we can print on polymers and plastics, paper, not any plastic, not any paper, some, there's some requirements for the quality and surface finish. We can do it on textile, very different forms of textile, foils, metal foils, okay? Uh, extremely thin, flexible glass even, okay? All these are possible in our, so I'm not even discussing what we are building on. The My question in this or this set of slides is addressing what kind of techniques available to us to make this low cost, large area, uh, and uh, additive friendly, eco friendly in that sense, uh, uh, technologies? The main difference uh, or main uh, insight that we need to gather as we understand this technology, uh, we've done some semiconductor basic 101 training yesterday for fabrication. We talked how important uh, is the accuracy and quality in many cases, but in that cases, you start with a substrate, you deposit films that you, uh, uh, for instance, uh, shape into a different conducting or insulating elements. Then you cover them with a photoresist before you do lithography, which is patterning through a, a light and a mask uh, on that uh, top layer that is given with orange color. And after you develop that pattern, you obtain the replica of the mask on that uh, film that you want to shape, and then that you can use that mask uh, film as an additional uh, mask, hard mask, to etch, remove underlying elements. So the photoresist uh, is used in this case, obviously, as a mask element. And, and eventually, you end up with the green film that you uh, deposited early on, shaped in the form of um, mask that you, uh, you brought in. So this is highly accurate, you could do this, uh, Intel and others are doing this at below 10 nanometer, we know, but we're not aiming that. But remember, flexible electronics is in microns, not in nanometers. That's typically a, 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 an important distinction, but what we can do is, we get a substrate, we go straight down to the deposit where we want it in the pattern we want it in one shot. It's a one, so we cut all the layers in between. Now. What happens is, educationally or STEM-wise or cost-wise, when you cut down the middle layers and show you could put that down on a substrate, a material in a specific shape, it simplifies the electronic manufacturing. Uh, it is the context for undergraduates, even younger um, you know, uh, uh, students who are interested in electronics and manufacturing can see the end product quicker and they can do this in low-cost tools in the, even in the classroom settings, and I, I believe this is where uh, yes. we have a lot of flexibility and interest. Uh, why I believe flextronics and flexible electronics is, is, is a precursor to learning uh, advanced electronics manufacturing. And we have a lot of tools, more than you possibly uh, probably imagine initially. 
So printing technologies can be largely, okay, uh, brought as non-contact techniques, where you know you don't have contact with the substrate, to versus contact printing. But whether it's contact or non-contact, everything can also brought into a third roll-to-roll uh, -roll printing, where, as I mentioned, you create rolls and seamless integration of one roll from entering to manufacturing one end with different printing and surface treatment tools, one after another in a single succession. We could do both non-contact and contact printings and integrate them from manufacturing environment in the roll-to-roll -roll printing uh, context. But non-contact printings, you could do screen printing. Uh, uh, I will bring a kit upstairs from, we will not do the screen printing, it's uh, uh, it's a well-known technique and you probably have seen, uh, I will spend that time more useful for other techniques in the afternoon, but I will bring you a set we have upstairs. We could do inch inkjet printing, slot die printing, we'll mention it a little bit. It's basically a similar concept, except you use a rolling uh, and, and a, a plate with a, a specific uh, slot to in, uh, pro provide the ink. And the, on the contact printing, we have host of technologies, most of them develop in Offset printing uh, uh, in the early days, gravure printing, flexography, micro contact printing, nano imprinting, die transfer printing. Not mentioning transfer printing, where you could take a circuit on a chip, cleave off the first 10 to 1 micron to 10 micron, and transfer the chip onto a surface. That's another way of getting uh, actually silicon chips imprinted into a flexible format. As you do, a uh, grand question that I did not explain or emphasize so far, how do we print? Where is the ink coming from? What kind of inks we have, right? Because after all, we are not using standard inks. We are using conductive or non-conductive specialized inks. <coughs> now, those inks will have a lot of nanomaterials, functional materials. That's where the secret ingredients. So you will find in flexible electronics, the starting point is often, often a lot of startups from university research because in universities we can come up with, take time to invent new inks. What is an ink? Think about it. It's a solvent is providing the solution capability, but the secret ingredient is the functional, uh, typically solids that are suspended in that fluid. And that fluid, that uh, suspended fluid could be dyed just giving the color in the case of uh, traditional paper printing for reading purposes, but we replace them with active electronic cont contact, either metal nanoparticles or uh, semiconductor particles or, uh, or insulating specialized films. So those fill, this is where the secret ingredient, this is flexible electronics firmly embedded to nanomaterial synthesis from that perspective of ink. Once you get the ink, it doesn't work. For instance, you can get copper uh, particles, 10 to 100 nanometer copper particles, copper particles. Put that in a solvent, try to print, it doesn't work. Because copper at that small dimension immediately oxidizes and it becomes useless for you. What you need to do is, you need to add additives and, uh, and surfactants, cover the, the copper particles with a, a basically a rounded, uh, coated with a molecular protection layer uh, from uh, oxidizing, and, and you also add surfactants so that it floats, interacts with the solvent, and it becomes suspend, uh, suspends in the fluid. Now you have uh, ink you could take to a conductive uh, form. Now it's a conductive ink you put into inkjet or other jets that we create for printing, jetting systems, and then print when the solvent evaporates, leaves behind that metallic elements. Now you need to typically do a heat process, quick heat process, or flash anneal uh, that dries the ink and leaves a conducting film behind. So that's the ink part. But how do you apply the ink is uh, where the printing technologies come. You could do screen printing. We have seen in the earlier videos that basically you have a screen with high resolution gaps in between and in small holes. This is typically a silk, uh, in the olden days it was a silk material, right? That's why it's called silk screen printing. But today's metal mesh, you could easily do 100 micron. The limit of screen printing is about 50 micron. You know, you, you are pushing the limits. The problem is that you're using many, uh, no, mechanical push and the inks in particles can be smaller, they can even get through, but the uh, forming the, the good quality film becomes problematic. 
gravier printing, what you're doing is there are two rotating disks in contact. Bottom, or bottom uh, ink, bottom uh, disk is scooping up ink in its surface because it has basically a pattern that you want to print, and that pattern has a low and high points. The ink basically uses the surface tension to reside in the gaps, and as you pass the printing material, and the impression cylinder pushes you the materials against that uh, bottom disk, and the ink is transferred to the material. And this is rotating and happening really fast, and you are only, uh, so the ink is basically in a reservoir, you're only picking up ink just about enough, and the excess drops back in. In the flux, flexographic printing, it's a little one degree more complex, in the sense that you are doing this, except uh, you have used a doctor plate, and then you, I think what uh, flex, flexographic does, uh, basically it uh, adds an additional cylinder that uh, I think more controls the uh, amount of ink and, and the accuracy better, and uh, it is uh, also uh, basically, you can bring multiple inks in this technique uh, if necessary. And in the jet printing, uh, which is the further to the right, you use the standard inkjet. What is it? You have a micro uh, uh, reservoir or chamber which includes the ink, and you have an orifice, a small opening tip, and then you push the ink in micro droplets. The droplet volume, you're talking about pico to nanoliters, typically picoliters. In very high resolution ones, I will show you an example. And typically, uh, consumer printers are using more like nanoliters, okay? How do you push the ink from this little chamber uh, is the question, and typically either you use thermal or uh, piezoelectric efforts, and these are uh, we're going to talk about. So basically, these are some of the printing techniques. Um, how do we form the jets? Is inkjet the only method? Uh, the inkjet, as I mentioned, use typically a piezo drive. Okay, uh, so the, there's a membrane that moves under applied voltage because it's a piezoelectric material and pushes the ink out of the orifice and, and we have an inkjet printer upstairs that is industrial inkjet printer for these purposes that can do uh, our devices on the right this is what we have the man is 2851 you are seeing that it is in action uh, 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 well it's printing a picture uh, and this is flat bat. It's not paper isn't rolling. It's flat bat, and the surface is heated. So you could actually print and dry immediately. Now there is a very promising aerosol printing technology. This is what uh, I believe a lot of industry is using today, because inkjets ultimately um, can get clogged or have uh, sometimes maintenance issue. In this case, in the aerosol of printing, what you do is you create a solution containing the ink comes through the center line of the nozzle and you have two, uh, uh, around that center line you have air flow or, or gas flow that is focusing that uh, and pulling that fluid down to the surface and then this distance between the tip of the nozzle and the surface could be as much as a couple of inches. So you use the uh, aerodynamics and, and the mechanical flow uh, design to focus that outcoming jet uh, literally focus on the surface. Because this is about an inch or about the surface, you could move the sample in three degrees of freedom. You could also take the nozzle rotated around three degrees of freedom. So you could actually print on a tennis ball, ping pong, or a cylinder, any curved surfaces with this technique. Whereas inkjet requires little more. I mean, inkjet can also print on flexible, sorry, uh, curved surfaces, but when you are printing on random surfaces, this jetting technique is very, very useful. You have other techniques, extrusion based, uh, where uh, this is like the 3D printing, traditional now 3D printing, extruding and heating and melting and then solidifying back again. A filament, this can be done at fine features down to the 100, uh, I think 30 micron, that is useful in some cases. But electrostatic printing, jetting with electrostatic pulses is very promising, and that can also go down to micron level. We will show uh, later on an example. Our, uh, our jet uh, nozzle printing or extrusion printer is uh, called something called sonoplot. Uh, sonoplot is essentially considered like a um, fountain pen. You dip a glass capillary. Here's the glass capillary. You dip it into the solution. It uploads the ink, 
by uh, uh, surface tension and, and, and capillary action. You don't do anything to upload the ink. You can dip it into any reservoir, pick up the ink mechanically by pressure uh, difference inside versus outside. And then it uses the electrostatic agitation uh, coming from this electrostatic ceramic, sorry, uh, piezoelectric ceramic, PZT uh, array. And then it jets out from the tip of the glass purely by ultrasonic agitation. And we could print, we print down to 10 micro with that. Uh, the issue with that is glass needs to be well made, otherwise it can chip away in the long run. So, the, so you can print with a glass tip about five times or so before it gets worse. So there is some techniques to uh, heat up the glass and, and make it more durable. So these are the two printers that we have. But of course, there are other techniques. Spin coating, high velocity uh, rotation dip of a disc to uh, spread the, spread the um, film widely uh, across large surfaces. This is well done. You, you can basically, you're not doing selective printing. You're just spreading the entire film across there. Uh, obviously, inkjet is mentioned. Uh, but the inkjet has two methods, remember? The inkjet thermal, by heating the ink and, and essentially you are boiling off a droplet, uh, pushing by uh, pressure difference or electrostatic membrane. We talked about flexographic and, and then the roll-to-roll -roll printing, and uh, uh, we also talk about uh, uh, use of active uh, uh, ink, uh, 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 jetting films. Printing materials, that's the question that now um, uh, we need to also remember that we are not talking about only conductive inks. Conducting inks are what I think started flexible electronics. Now you could make conducting lines just by printing, but we also need insulating inks. Conductive inks, we need higher uh, conductivity and low conductivity to make uh, different types of uh, resistors, for instance. Uh, and that often lower conductivity or uh, Instead of metallic uh, uh, conductive inks, we have carbon-based, carbon nanotube or graphene-based sol solutions that can produce um, interesting uh, options, low cost, and, uh, uh, and uh, different resistivity ranges available with them. Um, and we have, uh, obviously, semiconductive inks as well. Uh, you can actually bring metal oxides and some of the uh, organic semiconductors also printed uh, directly. What do we print on? Uh, typically, Captain, a polyimid film, uh, you see this amber film. It's very common if you open your phone, most likely the antennas on that phone is printed on a, uh, this uh, amber colored uh, flexible element. That's Captain is the commercial name. Uh, actually, the material is polyimid, and it is a very rigid, a very high quality polymer film that can withstand uh, upwards of 200 degrees in temperature, so it doesn't deform, so it's very uh, durable, and then you could uh, um, actually uh, use them in uh, some rough conditions. Uh, I don't think spin coating needs introduction because of the workshop we already covered, but the spin coating is very good when you are just making a thin film and, and just put enough, spread it out, uh, you, the velocity is important, um, how far you go, how fast you come up to that velocity is important as well as cool, uh, you know, as you spin down. So you basically make sure that you uh, have the good addition. The surface uh, needs to be conditioned. The ink or the material you want to deposit should uh, have uh, wet the surface. So wettability and surface uh, uh, use of surfactants may be needed if you want to get a, a uniform film. Uh, roll to roll, uh, we sold the roll to roll systems, rolling uh, discs, uh, transferring ink to the pattern, or, and then uh, and many versions of that exist, but this is for industrial. Typically, most university labs will not have roll to roll because the capacity is so high, and the, these devices are a little sizable. There's tabletop versions, I've seen as small as maybe five, six feet uh, systems, but even th that system can produce hundreds of sensors in an hour. Typically in research, unless you do a specific research for that reason, you don't need it. Um, here is um, uh, another uh, short video. Uh, how are we doing with time? Let's check. Um, yeah, uh, on this roll-to-roll uh, -roll manufacturing. Um, this is slow by 
high speed by any imagination, but the circuit is a little more complex and not regular in this case. You could also see it's a glossy and there's a fascinating surface there. Uh, so it's not just a paper or plastic. And it's just an exemplary. Uh, uh, the jets, uh, ink jets, um, you could heat the ink. The problem with the heater, uh, heat to use a heat mediated ink jet, you're heating the ink again and again, and it can cause uh, chemical issues, oxidation, this sort of issue. So heat is not really preferred method. Most modern systems use piezoelectric heating, uh, sorry, piezoelectric membrane, expanding in the volume that is limited, therefore pushing the ink out. And the size of the um, droplets is very important. If you can do picoliter, you can go down to a couple of microns. If you cannot do a picoliter, if you do more like 100 picoliter or uh, nanoliter, you're talking about 10 to 30. Uh, the best uh, sort of commercial devices, uh, they tell about 30 micron is the limit, uh, practical limit. Uh, the issue is basically as um, you bring the ink out, the droplet forms, and the droplet is a dynamic thing. It's, it's kind of changing shape as it moves down in the milliseconds or microseconds it goes down. It essentially oscillating because of the pressure waves. And as it splashes on the surface, it broadens. So you're not getting an exact shape uh, raining down and remaining as it is. There's a, a dynamic process. In fact, um, they do uh, an interesting thing with the inkjet printers, you put one drop, simple droplet, it comes down and you make a solvent that is super fast in evaporating. What it does, it evaporates to form what we call coffee ring effect. Coffee ring effect, when you put the coffee uh, mark on, the, on your table, if there's some spillage, you get a circle, right? You could make one drop land down, evaporate so fast, the remaining inks will form an, a, a micron uh, scale ring. So this has been used actually in uh, cre creatively. So you could actually use, if you do the engineering of one single droplet, you could go down to a micron type of rings and circular elements. Screen printing, I, I, I did mention there's a little bit of reputation in my slides because I joined two sets I use in different contexts. And um, here's the industrial screen. Of course, you don't do hand uh, use of hands uh, in the case of uh, industrial, but industrial ones are fast and very accurate, and then they can exert more pressure, more even pressure is very important, and, and uh, they can actually be very productive uh, for large scale manufacturing as well. I don't think there's sound in this one. Puts the material down. Make sure no creases. First pass, and then here's a star. Uh, pattern form. Here's the second one. This is manual, of course. You could actually do this roll, roll to roll. The roll can move on, comes down, swipes, move on, etc. So this is uh, very. Um, and the doctor blade will be, uh, I mentioned the name doctor blade, will be rotating version of this where the screen is static. In the doctor blade, the elements will be on the perimeter of the surface of the cylinder. As it rolls, it will push the ink down, uh, and, and there is uh, basically different variations of this. And at the exit, you can heat it up as the material comes down. Here it is already printed. Obviously, this is large, uh, very large pattern, but you could go down to 100 micron. A lot of the batteries, a lot of those blood um, testing elements in the diabetes, uh, diabetic patients use for uh, pricking their fingers for blood tests, those things are today printed in this fashion. Okay, in the interest of time, the last uh, bit of the nozzle techniques. So you could do spray coating, the nozzles, we'll talk about that uh, in the next slides in more detail because I will show you some amazing results recent uh, uh, available systems. So here you are as good as your nozzle, the distance and how forcefully you are pushing the material, what technique you use. Because as it comes out of the nozzle, it can spray out. You may prefer that for large area coverage or you may, you may want to focus it using uh, different techniques. Uh, an interesting technique that is coming from surface science is uh, deep coating. 
what you could do is you could assemble nanoparticles or nano ink or a monolayer on the solvent. You could dip the element, pull it very regularly and steadily out. And what is assembling on the surface as nanofilm, like oil slate, for instance, right? It will transfer onto the material. So this can be actually used for large object deep coating, very fast and large area. Uh, okay. So some interesting results in nozzle printing. Here's a one micron, or in fact, 0.8 micron uh, system. This is a Polish uh, 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 company that recently, XTPL. Uh, so some of the results they show. So what they do is they take in a very traditional and simple approach to the extreme. They simply push a high density uh, uh, viscous ink through a nozzle, steel nozzle, ceramic, I think aluminum nozzle. Uh, it's, they have different options by pure pressure, but they adjusted things so right they are able to get this content. This paste is this is not even an ink. It's 75, uh, 70 or 75 percent solid. So it dries really fast, and if you can do this right, you can also extrude that into three-dimensional objects. So this thing is 300 nanometer height. The distance, uh, it is one micron accurate table, 0.7 uh, micron gap. Over here, they have other examples. They can go across the ends of a vertical wall very easily because their head can rotate, I think, about 45 degrees. So you can go across the vertical walls of, so they are using this in chip chip packaging, for instance, they can go over multiple steps uh, and they can, as I told you, do rounding uh, shapes very easily. This system looks like this. It's not massive, it's actually, uh, and it is uh, one of my target, uh, I'm writing a couple of proposals on this. Uh, hopefully, try to get this because you could do one micron printing all day if you want with this material. The second technique that is this, this is kind of finest uh, approaches of uh, from Japan, this system is called Superfine Inkjet. They use high pulses on a uh, nozzle glass, uh, metallic coated glass tip, just like our Sonoplot. The difference is Sonoplot doesn't use voltage to excite ultrasound. So if they use a voltage pulse on a glass nozzle coated inside with a metal electrode, and they can spit picoliter size uh, droplets, forming this extremely high resolution patterns, and they can also extrude by Pitting and moving in the Z direction, devices as small as uh, one micron, they, I think, advertise 0.8 micron accuracy. And the system looks like this, just like another inkjet tip. And uh, one of the good things, that, despite their high resolution, these things are actually very, uh, A, affordable. Uh, I'll talk about $100,000 <coughs> range for electronic manufacturing. That's a reasonable cost. Plus, uh, their consumable cost is an immense. A uh, uh, super fine inkjet needs a glass uh, coated uh, capillary, and they are more cost relatively speaking. And the, uh, the other one, XTPL, doesn't really need to replace the because it's either steel or aluminum tip that lasts quite a long time. Okay, and uh, they are not uh, difficult to find materials. So that's where I end. So uh, basically, these are types of printing techniques. And uh, as you can see, I have hardly spoke about electrical engineering in these printing techniques. There are mechanical, chemical engineering techniques that are widely available. And uh, we're talking about things printing things from inches to, to, to feet to the micron, a very wide range. And, and we can uh, basically do this additive manufacturing at different scales, at different uh, details, depending on all those applications I indicated in the morning. So the quality, the, the limit is what ink you, do you want to print. So you need to get reliable inks, inks that are low cost, obviously shouldn't uh, cost a fortune. And this is one key parameter. If the inks are in low supply, they could be expensive because only one company is making, right? But if you go volume manufacturing, roll to roll, you're buying gallons of this material, okay, uh, you're using. So it becomes really, really affordable. Um, and the second thing is the substrates. Your substrates and your ink should be consistent. Like any other manufacturing, if your supplier is giving you inconsistent quality, uh, 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 questionable material, your performance will, uh, of printing will also become limited. So I will stop here. We, uh, uh, I guess uh, this is the time. But 
Uh, any questions are welcome on this printing technologies. Yes? Is the volume of the print limited by the nozzle or the surface touching material, or what, what limits that volume? A lot of things. Number one, I think nozzle and nozzle dynamics play a big important, whether you are pulsing, whether you're using uh, air uh, flow to focus material, uh, and then the nozzle shape even, even the nozzle element, because the fluid to nozzle interactions are important, but also the distance, and whether you're landing at certain velocity, you splash a lot. You can have the smallest droplet which splashes and makes a splatter, and then you know, it then lose the quality of the, and also the distance. So that is why the nozzle printers, some of them say 30 micron, 50 micron limit in, in resolutions, and the, the last two devices, they are able to get to one micron. And now one micron is very interesting because with one micron, you could do packaging in chip and other electronics, MEMS, optics, packaging, that's very important, so that, that's re really applicable. The fact that they can also do vertical walls is quite impressive. So just out of curiosity, you can make the nozzle dimensions nano scale, and then is it just that surface tension can't push the fluid through? Yes, that's the limit, the yeah, that's the limit. Yeah. And two limits there, surface tension is uh, your enemy then because you really have a lot of forces, electrostatic binding forces of the fluid, the solid fluid interface, is so immense, so you can't really push these in narrow, uh, long endings of uh, nozzles. The second issue is also nanoparticles that you use for ink. Typically, uh, there's, a, there's a paradox. You want tiniest particle if you can, let's say 5 nanometer, 10 nanometer, but they become more susceptible to environmental impact, oxidizing or others. When you dry them, the film that you form is low resistivity, uh, high resistivity, lower conductivity than the bulk material. So conversely, you want to maybe make bigger chunks, one micron particles, but they can go through the nozzles now. The sweet spot is uh, 50 nanometer to 100 nanometer, a lot of the inks manufactured, because they're just big enough particles. When you merge them these nanoparticles, they will form a film about a couple of 100 nanometer, maybe 100 nanometer, with, with some continuity. That's the kind of sweet spot. Therefore, the nozzle, you're right, we can't re really do nozzle. If you could do it, literally, we could print at 10 nanometer. That would be wonderful, but that's the limit. You're talking about enormous pressures. Yes? We're guessing there is, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm guessing there is uh, limitations based upon the particular type of technology for the printing that you want to do based upon the substrate that you want to print on. And the top coat that you want to put over. Absolutely. Surface plays a, uh, that's the heat. Surface is, I, that's probably um, the last, uh, how do you say, uh, fine print I should mention. Surface is very important. How you finish that surface, the roughness of the surface, okay? Because the dead ink that came in, the droplet, if it doesn't want to stick to surface, the surface isn't wettable, it's going to roll around uh, and it's not going to be very good condition. Conversely, if your surface is extremely porous, the ink will wick through. It won't remain in the surface. So you will lose the ink. You could put buckets and it will just soak up. Uh, you know, it goes everywhere inside that volume. So the surface finish, and that's one issue in paper. You can't print in every print because a lot of the paper will wick the solution. So you need most of the papers finished with a fine top layer, for instance, uh, for good printing purposes. Exactly. So surface finish is very, very important. Also, velocity. If you're doing roll-to-roll -roll printing, you're going so fast. You could smudge things, so you need to give enough time for dynamics of that droplet or printing element to dry, or or um, you know interact the right way. Uh, one last thing is you need to do a lot of quality control, like any manufacturing. So in roll to roll systems, <coughs> often there will be test stations about thickness monitoring, line uh, sort of accuracy monitoring, uh, etc. So those things will add up obviously to the complexity. So in, in traditional integrated circuit semiconductor manufacturing, you're talking about layering. So yes. There's a Z component here Bet. too. Is this the same thing? The same, same thing. We just How about dissimilar materials overlapping. And exactly. We are more flexible with materials. We can so one roll or one printing station in the roll to roll does one layer, moves on to the next one as another layer, next one as a conductive layer or electrodes in right places. So we keep adding on. We are doing the same game in a simpler, much simpler, and 
much uh, higher, lower resolution. I saw a hand there, yes. Uh, in case of changing the substance, the, the ink? Free, yeah, the ink. Uh, is there any chance to change it? And if so, uh, how you control density of that? Because you said that this very, very, very good question. That's some, I didn't want to get too technical for general purpose. The viscosity of the ink is very important. Inkjet is limited typically uh, in the range of viscosity. It's not too, uh, not, not too low, not too high. Whereas some of the nozzle printers have a lot wider range. So the, uh, the viscosity is a very key element. Changing ink is very secret kind of uh, challenge here. In an inkjet, typically you have one ink, one cartridge. So you need multiple cartridges or multiple inks if in a a head put on the head with multiple drive electronics, so that can make more complex. But then you could do multiple. Our Sonopla printer, the one that looks like fountain pen, this is why we bought it. We can dip on any ink, write it, bring it to the solution to clean it, clean the tip, dip it into the another one. So we can, could keep doing this as long as the inks are easy to wash off. Typically, you need to use water or alcohol-based inks so that is, they are easy to wash off. No, that, that's the key thing. Yes, otherwise, typically you don't want to really, in research, that's doable. In manufacturing, you want to dedicate one system for one ink and keep doing reliable, reliable the whole day. No, that's how they do it in the real manufacturing environment. All right, I think my time is up. Uh, any other question? We can speak over the break and lunch.